Hello, art historians, and welcome to our first lecture of our Egyptian art, where we're actually going to start looking at some of the pieces that reflect the context of what we know life was like in ancient Egypt. And a really good place to start with that is a piece that shows Egypt before it was actually Egypt. And that is going to be this piece right here, which is called the Narmer palette. Now, really, really important for you guys to understand, the Narmer palette is when we look at Egyptian art that's divided into like Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, New Kingdom, those are when Egypt is one Egypt. Once upon a time, there used to be Upper and Lower Egypt, and there wasn't just one pharaoh, all of it, over all of it. This is a piece that is right before or right during the time when Egypt becomes one Egypt. So we call this pre-dynastic Egypt because Egypt is ruled by a series of ruling families or dynasties that rule for kind of like long periods of time. So this is before that really gets started. So this piece right here actually is really important to Egyptian history because it is believed to be the story of the unifying of Upper and Lower Egypt by King Narmer. And it has some of the earliest hieroglyphics that have actually ever been found. And hieroglyphics are the Egyptian form of writing. And what this is, it's an actual functional item because if you can see on the back side where the two serpentine figures have their necks intertwined right there in that circle, that was used for like crushing up that black eyeliner and eye makeup that Egyptians used on their eyes. So it was functional. But it also told this really important story and it tells the story in registers. So from top to bottom and front to back. And those registers we've seen before in the standard of Ur, where you kind of just divide it into lines, kind of like on lined paper, like this is the next thing that happens and this is the next thing that happens. And this story shows King Narmer, who on the front is bigger than everybody else. So we see that high, you know, hierarchy of scale which we also see in Mesopotamia, basically taking action to kill his enemies and unite Upper and Lower Egypt together, like perhaps killing an, you know, a rival king and therefore uniting Egypt under his rule as one ruler. So there's lots and lots of Egyptian, like, like not excuse me, Mesopotamian works that can be compared to this. And that's something to kind of start thinking about maybe for the test. Like for example, it shows a battle scene that's something the standard of Ur does. It's also told in registers. That is something the standard of Ur does. And it tells an actual historical event, which we think the standard of Ur does. So just some kind of things of, to keep in mind whenever you're looking at comparing the Narmer palette to other works of art in Mesopotamia. Okay, so why is the Narmer palette so important? I don't know why that just did that with the effects. I didn't mean to do that. But again, in terms of historical significance, they're pretty sure that this tells the story of the unifying in Upper and Lower Egypt. It's got the battle scenes, and it also shows Narmer. On one side, he's wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, which kind of looks like a bowling pin. And you can see this up here at the top. And then on the other side, he's wearing the lower crown. And whenever in Egyptian art, you see those two crowns combined, that is the ruler of upper and lower Egypt together. So the fact that he's got one crown on one side and one crown on the other kind of shows like, okay, he probably was unifying this together. Now remember, Egyptian art follows a very strict canon or set of rules. Like these are things that in Egypt, if you're showing a pharaoh or you're showing somebody important, you have to show them in this way. And the Narmer palette, one of the earliest works of art, because this is so important in Egypt, probably helps set those rules of, okay, if you're going to show a pharaoh, this is how he needs to be shown. So for example, Narmer is shown in composite view or that twisted perspective where his head is facing to the side. So you can see his profile like they, cause this way you can't see as much of the face this way. They thought you could, his chest is forward. All right. His legs are forward and then his feet are turned the other way so that you can see both feet and his hands are out to the side. So you can see both. And they didn't actually really care that it was the right hand or the left hand. It was just the thumb is on the top. So that's how it works, because that way it didn't matter if you saw the front of the hand or the back of the hand, you're seeing the hands. 
So big important rules, composite view, that's how you show the Pharaoh. He always is supposed to look calm, like nothing is bothering him. Like he is steady like the Nile. This is easy. He's unshakable. We saw this a lot with Assyrian art as well, that you're giving that impression that nothing bothers you, nothing gets to you. So composite view, twisted perspective, hierarchy of scale, and the pharaohs always look like what they're doing is not that difficult. Even when he is in the smiting pose, like he is about to smash somebody in the head, still looks perfectly calm. Now, we also see in the palette that combination of religion and rule, because remember, those two things go hand in hand in ancient civilizations. And we see here that just like we've seen in Mesopotamian art, here you have in the palette, you have Horus, who is the hawk. And he is basically, it's really weird. He's reaching out and like giving something to approval or giving Narmer his approval, but he has a human hand. It's really weird. It's so kind of like that weird combination of animals and humans we've seen before. But he's giving his approval to Narmer. Like the gods are blessing this, which really fits because the Egyptians thought the pharaohs were gods. Like not just blessed by the gods, but they were gods. And that's also where we have the bulls. We've seen this before. We've seen it in Persepolis. We've seen it in Mesopotamia. Bulls were pretty powerful things to take down. And a bull could be destructive and a bull could be very powerful. So they believe that the bulls represent the gods blessing what Narmer is doing, but they also believe the bull could be Narmer himself. Like it could be him coming in and just crashing through and wrecking everything and, you know, basically destroying it and uniting upper and lower Egypt. So this is just a little breakdown of uh, some really important things we see in the Narmer palette that kind of became standard. Like this is what you would kind of see, like especially if a pharaoh was shown in battle or in victory, it's called the, the mace pose or like the smiting pose. It never changes. Like for 3000 years, if you're gonna show a pharaoh and he's gonna be killing somebody, this is how it's going to look. Um, he's unshaken, he's not moving. Notice he's wearing the crown of upper Egypt and behind him is his sandal bearer. Why does he not have sandals on? It could be to show that this is so easy, I can do it barefoot, or it could be because he's in the presence of Horus, who is a god, so therefore he's showing himself barefoot as humble, right? You over here, you have the hawk or the falcon with Horus. Um, again, he's handing this with a human arm and basically saying like, okay, this is my blessing. Now, I do like that they say that he's standing on like the reeds like that would come out of the Nile because that was lower Egypt. So it's basically like, okay, you are uniting these two together. So then you flip it over to the back and it's basically like, okay, one side is, you know, upper Egypt and then he is destroying lower Egypt and uniting these together. So now here on the back, he's wearing the crown of lower Egypt because he defeated lower Egypt. So therefore he's going to unite these together. And Again, um, the Egyptians are very literal in how they show things. They want you to see as much as possible. So it doesn't really look naturalistic. So to make sure you understood just how many bodies they killed, they turned them sideways. Like instead of stacking the bodies, like you can't really see that they're bodies. Let's turn them sideways this way so you can see that. Oh, and let's make sure you realize that they're decapitated and their heads are put between their legs. Like this is a shot sign of like huge embarrassment to them. Then you've got, of course, on the backside, you have a priest who is leading him, but he's still smaller than the Pharaoh because he is not as important as the Pharaoh is. And it's like, basically this is divine right. Like this is the gods bless this. This is what was meant to happen. And then down there at the very bottom, you have the two twisted um, serpentine lion combinations that is like, that's the unification of upper and lower Egypt symbolically. Like now they're connected together. And then at the bottom is like, basically this is who Narmer was. He is, he is the bull. I am strong like bull. Like he's going to come in, knock down the walls of lower Egypt and unite them together. So a whole lot of iconography and symbols that people from Egypt would recognize. Like they'd recognize the sandal bearer they would recognize the crowns. They would recognize the bulls. Like they would go, oh, I think I can put this together. Now, 
again, remember, the Egyptians are very, very, very big on the fact that you follow the rules in art. You, this is how you show people in art, especially pharaohs, right? The less important you were, the less it mattered because your soul in the afterlife really did not matter. But for the upper people, like the pharaohs, who are actually going into the heavens and can still send their soul down to wreak havoc here if they're not happy, you better make sure you're showing them right, which means you need to show lots of stuff about them. They need to be honored for things they did in life. They need to be told what they were supposed to do in death. Apparently, the Egyptian soul was not very bright. Like, you needed all kinds of stuff on all the walls, for not only people to know that their greatness, but also for the uh, the soul to come back and recognize itself. But also a lot of the time there were like instructions for the soul of like, this is what you do in case you get lost. Because apparently the soul wasn't very bright. But because the Egyptians kept doing the same thing and the Nile kept flooding, they're like, we're not going to change that. We're going to keep doing exactly the same thing. And we're going to follow these rules. We're going to keep doing it the exact same way and not change it. So for example, showing the bodies in composite view, right? Where again, if you're more important, they're really going to follow this. If you're less important, they don't have to follow the rules so much because your soul and its happiness and its anger didn't really matter. You're also going to use a lot of hierarchy of scale because remember, apparently the soul is not very smart. It needs to know who the most important person is. So you make them bigger. That sends a message to the living and to the dead. Um, what the pharaohs believed or the Egyptians believed is that your soul or your ka could come back. All right. And it could visit statues. It could see stuff on the wall. It could take the sacrifices and the offerings that you leave for it. So it really needs to be happy um, as much as possible. So you use the art to do that, to make the soul happy. And again, another rule is you tell the story in registers. Like you tell it in like horizontal lines. Like this is the top line of the story. This is the second line of the story. This is what happens next. So you read it kind of like top to bottom left to right, so you know the story that it's telling because the souls really like to remember the things that they did in life and they wanted the people still living to remember what they did in life. Okay, so we'll, I'm gonna skip that. So you can see here, here's some of these examples of how like they just, they're gonna follow the rules. Like the head had to be this many block, like they would actually draw a grid like on the wall. And it's like, okay, the head is gonna be this many blocks high, the torso is supposed to be this many blocks, even if it's tiny blocks, it's still the head is this many blocks high, the body is this many blocks high, we need to follow the proportions, follow the standards, this is how you show a pharaoh. And you can see that composite view right there, the head is in profile, the body is forward, the hips and the legs are twisted, and then the feet are off to the side. Like it's, this is how you see as much of the body as possible. These are the rules. The Nile kept flooding, so let's not break them. All right. A large part of where you're going to see a lot of this art is going to be on tombs. And it's also going to be on religious buildings and political buildings. Because ultimately, the art was to honor the religions and the rulers. And basically, since the rulers were gods, a combination of both. And they would use um, very natural materials when they would do these paintings that were very sticky, like egg whites were very sticky. So they would mix the paint with that so that it stayed because Egyptian paint actually holds up really, really, really well, like really well. Okay. Now that canon of proportions that you follow, that canon or rules you follow when you show people on wall paintings or papyrus like drawings, there's also rules for how you show them when it comes to statues, right? This is even more important probably because they believed, especially since so many of these were found in tombs, that the soul could come back and go into this statue. So it had better be able to recognize itself and it had better be happy with the body that it has because the body that it has in the statue is the body that would have in the afterlife. So if it's missing a hand or it's missing an arm, your soul is going to be very irritated and something really bad could happen. So there were very, very strict rules, especially for upper class Egyptians that you follow when you show them as a statue. And typically that's either gonna be standing 
or sitting. You never really show them in action much because these guys are just calm. They're chill. They are literally the rock of Egypt. And that's how you depict them. They are strong and steady and unmoving just like the Nile was because they were the representation of that. So one thing about Egyptian statues, if you were an important person, like a pharaoh or a god, you don't have a whole lot of expression. You're not smiling. You're not laughing. You may have a little bit of a grin, maybe, depending on what time of Egyptian art it is. But I don't care if the statue is 40 feet tall or four feet tall. They look calm. Very, very calm. Because they, like the Nile, are unwavering. They are steady. Nothing is really working them up. Here's another thing. They, the, emo, the Egyptians believe that emotions are fleeting. Like, and you guys know this, you can be really happy one second and like really sad the next second. That means change. Mm -mm. These guys are not changing, right? They're eternal. Emotions come and go and change. These guys do not. Their power stays. It's an expression of po power. It's a flex, all right? Also, they believe that the statues would need the spirit to animate it, to bring it to life. So it's not going to have emotion unless the spirit is there, which obviously they never actually saw. So it needed to be like a blank canvas for whenever the soul actually did come into the statue, if they decided that that's what they wanted to do. Now, another thing about statues, a lot of the times they were painted, all right? We see a lot of them in the, the original stone that they were carved out of, but that may just be the conditions that they were preserved in. A lot of the times they were painted. And one thing that they did with the paint is conveyed gender roles. So a really good thing to look for is that males were shown dark and tan because they were outside doing the things. They were a manly man. They were rugged. They were tough. A female, if she was upper status, she's going to be shown white, very, very, very pale white because she's not outside working with her hands. She doesn't have to. Food is brought to her. If she goes outside, it's because she wants to, and she was usually covered with an umbrella. Um, another thing about these statues that I didn't mention in the notes is typically if you notice the, the headdresses that they're wearing, even though it's really hard to see in some of the statues, they were wigs. Lice was a common problem and heat was a common problem. A lot of the times Egyptians, even Greek, like later like Cleopatra, they wore wigs. All right, so that was kind of another way to delineate a male versus a female. Her wig would always be a little bit longer. But Egypt was different. Like in terms of women, they were viewed way more equally to men than in other societies. And they would be shown alongside them as like co-rulers or like support, but generally shorter. And while a male, like a pharaoh, if he's shown standing, he's shown with his feet apart and he's stepping forward, typically with his left foot forward, but his weight back on his right foot, right? And the bigger the stance, like the bigger the power flex that it was, women would be shown with their feet standing together um, because they don't have to take that power pose, right? They're just standing there kind of as a support. And you'll notice that these guys right here, a pharaoh, his, his fists are clenched uh, in strength and power, but this is also to make sure that those fingers aren't apart and don't break off because then that pharaoh is going to be very unhappy if he comes back to that statue and he doesn't have any fingers. So women were could be shown because they weren't as important but pretty pretty equal in the society. They could be shown much more naturalistically where the men were shown much more ideally. Like this is what a perfect person would look like. Now a really good example of this is Menkare and his queen. And Menkare is actually more famous than people know because if you go to the Great Pyramids of Giza, you have three big pyramids there. You have Khufu, who is the largest, his son Khafre, who sits up the highest and looks the biggest, but it's not, and then Menkare. And when they did, when they got into Menkare's tomb, all right, they found so many statues. And one of them that stood out the most to them was this one, which is Menkare and his queen with kind of an asterisk, which I'll explain. And it is made out of gray walk. And gray walk, as you have seen before, is extremely hard to carve, which means it's going to be very time consuming. It's gonna be hard to break, which is really important because you don't want things breaking off and the Pharaoh being angry, right? But this is an example of a Ka statue. 
that the Pharaoh's soul could inhabit along with his queen, again, with an asterisk. And this is pretty standard in terms of how you show a Pharaoh standing up. He is stepping forward in the Pharaoh pose. So he's got the step forward, left foot forward, but weight back on his right foot. There is no negative space here. And what I mean is negative means like blank or open space. They have a thing behind them, like a rock wall. Like basically it almost looks like they're emerging out of a wall, kind of like they're coming out of the tomb. But you'll notice like there's no empty space where something could break off or crack because this was a Pharaoh. He, we want to make sure his, his statue is perfect. If his soul comes back to it, he has his hands clenched at his side, strong, sturdy. He's wearing what's called the Neem's headdress. This identifies him as a Pharaoh, that headdress right there. Like that's, that's standard Pharaoh. He has on the fake beard. They all wore this fake beard. It was kind of ceremonial, like symbol of the Pharaoh. And he's shown ideal, muscular. This is what the perfect body would look like. Very stoic expression. Like nothing's really working him up. Nothing's really worrying him. And then there is his queen next to him, who is, as you can see, she's his perfect counterpoint. She is, if he is the masculine, she is the ideal feminine. They put her in a very clingy tight dress. So you can see all her feminine features to be like, this is the ideal female because of course he's the ideal male. So she would want to look like that. Um, you can see it emphasizes that line there kind of near like the, the reproductive area, which would be kind of like representing the womb. Like, so kind of like the idea of where a baby would be held. So kind of identifying her as a female. She has a very slight smile, right? She is happy to be his support. Remember, she's a woman and she's not the Pharaoh. She can be shown more naturalistic, but she's supporting him. She's, she's not holding him up, but she is there to support him and be basically the support of Egypt. Now, couple interesting things about this statue though, all right? It definitely follows the rules. Like it follows the canon for sure. But there are some unique things about Menkari and his queen that are just a little bit different, all right? Number one, they're both stepping forward. That typically didn't happen. She is a female, would have her feet together. So she must be kind of a big deal if she's given a little bit of a, a power pose. Another thing about it, if you look back, she's almost exactly the same height, that shows her almost as his identical equal, which is, again, strange for that time. Another really strange thing about it is she is the one facing directly forward. Like she is fully front on, whereas he is almost just a little bit at an angle, almost like she twisted him. Like, here, honey, look, like she kind of went like this and he was kind of like, huh? He's just a little bit off from that. Another thing about this is his face is not perfect. It's a little fleshy. Um, his features are not perfectly proportioned. He had a little bit of a bigger nose and his lips were a little bit bigger. Um, not that anything's wrong with those, but they weren't like in perfect mathematical proportion, which the Greeks are going to be really good at. And it really shows kind of a naturalistic face. Like this is how Menkare would have looked. So you can actually tell like that's him. Like, it's not just a pharaoh, it's, it's Menkare. Like, that's how he looked. So it's weird. They think that because of these things, there's some theories about this, that she might actually have been the more important of the two. Like, maybe she's actually, they call her his queen, but maybe she's actually his mother or even a goddess because the, the step forward that's a little bit different. And her height, that definitely stands out. Um, but a weird fact about this is the paint on this had flaked off. There's some traces of it on her wig and around his face that it was painted, but it flaked off really, really easily considering where it was buried. And the idea was kind of like that. It's like decaying flesh because this was found in a tomb that the flesh would pe like peel away and then the soul would be left underneath. It's like the blackness was kind of like the soul that was left. So kind of weird. So here you guys can kind of see it. All right, now let's, let's look at something completely different. Okay, so now remember, 
there are very strict rules about how you show a pharaoh or you show a god. And, you know, they are very, very important that how happy they are in the afterlife is pretty important. But the less important you were, the more you could look like you, like the more naturalistic you could actually look. And a really good example of that is the seated scribe. And the seated scribe, or they, some people call it the squatting scribe, but he's definitely not squatting. He's sitting. Now, here's the thing about a scribe. In Egypt, if you could write, you were a huge deal. Like that was one of the top professions you could be because you were a record keeper. You could, you know, write spells. You could write things to the gods. You were a huge deal if you knew how to write. So the fact that he has a statue of him at all, that says something, that scribes were highly, highly valued. But he's not a pharaoh. They don't really care how happy his soul is in the afterlife. Um, it's not like this guy is going to get mad and cause the Nile not to flood. So they can show him much more naturalistically how he actually would look. All right. So this scribe is he's not in the best shape. He's not. There's a lot of negative space. Like you can see the space between his torso and his arms. Like his arms could break off at any time. His head could break off at any time. This is limestone. Like it's not like gray walk. Like limestone could be broken. It'd be hard to do. Um, there's a lot of like tombstones and stuff that are made of limestone. It's hard to break, but it's not impossible. Gray walk is a little bit tougher. All right. But he's, he's not in the best shape. Now for people who go, oh wait, they're kind of like talking bad about him. Actually, they're not. Um, this means that he's well fed. Um, he doesn't have to be outside exercising and hunting his food or farming in the field. He's allowed to get a little, you know, thicker because he has all the food he needs. He has such an important job. People bring food to him. So it shows like this was a status symbol. Like the more weight you had on you, like this kind of bod, like definitely the more important and wealthy you were. Now, when I say that they make this naturalistic, and I mean, like, they make it look like it naturally looks, they really, really did. Not only was it carved very naturalistically with his natural body shape, and it's painted in that brown, which not super dark, because he wouldn't have been outside all the time. What stands out most about the scribe is his eyes, where they went through some really, really intense effort to make sure those eyes looked naturalistic, which would make sense. You're a scribe. You need to be able to see to write. So I guess that makes sense. But in the eyes, they actually used a marble that has red running through it. So it actually looks like the red in the sclera of your eyes. Like it looks very, very creepily naturalistic. And then they would use organic blue material within the iris that they put and kind of sealed into it. So it, he has blue eyes. And then they used black coal, like to make it look like the black lining that Egyptians would have had around their eyes, which was very common because it was very bright and it kind of helped reflect the sun, kind of like football players put like black under their eyes, kind of the same idea. But it really makes those eyes pop. For those of you guys who like to do eye makeup, you're like, yes, it does. It really accentuates the color of the eyes and the black really brings out the white against the red. So not only did they make this guy like, okay, you're important enough to have a statue and sorry, we can't make you look ideal. We can't like make you look perfect because you're not a pharaoh, but we're going to make you look like you as much as we possibly can because you do serve an important job and you are an important member of society. All right, we're going to stop there because our next section of the lecture starts going into where you would find a lot of these statues and a lot of these paintings. And that is going to be in the Egyptian tombs and their temples.